Professor Jerome Max in our society. Welcome, Professor. Uh, also, a grand thanks to distinguished speaker, Dr. Nazar Hassan Isa, a senior consultant cardiologist in Al Nasriya Heart Center. He is a well known figure in cardiology to talk about update treatment of heart failure. And uh, a great thanks to my dear great brother, Allah, great brother, Dr. Mohammed Hashim. Uh, he is a senior consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist who he is well-known cardiologist in Iraq and to be chairman for this interesting meeting with me. And a big thanks to all attendants of this very interesting meeting, to my teacher who are attend this meeting, to my colleague to attend this meeting uh, with the preservation of all titles. Welcome to everybody, everyone. I'm very thankful to uh, Asino Company to support such interesting activity. Thanks, Professor Jiron. Again, thanks to all. Uh, start, Dr. Mohammed Hashim, to chairman of this interesting meeting. Father, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is uh, my honor to introduce Professor Jiron Bax, who is a director of non-invasive imaging and director of the eco-laboratory in the Department of Cardiology at Leiden University Medical Center, the Netherlands. He is also past president of the European Society of Cardiology. His main interest of research is related to imaging in clinical cardiology, in particular, the integration of different imaging techniques nuclear cardiology, echocardiography, multi-slice computed tomography, and magnetic resonance imaging into clinical issues. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your time. And uh, uh, we are uh, actually hungry to uh, listen to your lecture. Uh, please uh, start your lecture. OK, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you about imaging and heart failure. And um, we're gonna speak first about imaging in reduced ejection fraction. And then we're gonna speak a little bit about imaging and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, before we start, I want to deeply apologize because the previous time when I was supposed to speak, I came home and I fell asleep and I, I did not wake up. So that never happened before that I missed something. So I'm very sorry about that. And um, I wanna thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. I'm lecturing from my home, as you can see, because it's a little bit in the evening here. And um, I'm just gonna, if, the, if I can move them. Yeah, I can move them like this. Okay, so here we go. I think it is always best to start with a patient example, and then we see what sort of people we're talking about. On the one hand, we're very successful in cardiology with doing all sorts of procedures. At the same time, by doing all this, uh, PCI, PCI, bypass, etc., patients live longer, but at the end, they have one infarction, two infarction, three infarction, and the ventricle gets bigger and bigger and more infarct tissue is in the ventricle. So the end product that we are creating in a way is patients with heart failure. And so in a way we are the victim of our own success because in the past you had one infarction and you did not survive. But now we can do a lot of things, but it comes with a price and we start to realize more and more how we can earlier intervene and how we can be better in that. I'm gonna give you this example here. This is a man, 62 years old. In 1987, he has the first infarction, which is an infraposterolateral infarction. In 1988, he has a second infarction. In 1994, he has a third infarction. And in 1996, he gets bypass surgery. 
in 2000, he has his first non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. He has also comorbidities. He has diabetes type 1. He has COPD. And he has chronic renal failure, um, as indicated here. He presents to us with reduced exercise capacity. He has heart failure symptoms, New York class 3. He is dizzy and hypotensive. He has a weight of 53 kilos by a length of 140, 164 meters. And his blood pressure is 90 over 65. And then we hear, when we listen, we hear a holosystolic murmur, three out of six on the apex. So we know that that means, right? That means that he has probably significant mitral regurgitation. If we talk about severe heart failure patients, to determine your therapy, you need to have information. And the simple information that we always look for is what is a person's LV function and size? Does he have coronary artery disease? Most of them do have that. Does he have ischemia and or viability? And should I reconsider to revascularize him? And does he have a severe mitral regurgitation? All of that is focusing on the potential therapy. Should we go medical and not intervene? Or should we go beyond medical and intervene? Intervene can be as simple as bypass surgery, PCI. It can also affect the valves. If there's severe mitral regurgitation, we can do, when we do bypass surgery, we do the valve as well. We do a mitral valve repair. At the same time, we can now always, uh, also nowadays do a lot of these transcatheter heart valve procedures. Most of them are done on the aortic valve, but we do a lot of transcatheter mitral repair with mitral clips. We can also do transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And when we realize that once there is severe LV dysfunction and severe mitral regurgitation, then often the right ventricle starts to dilate and that follows by tricuspid regurgitation. And also that we can do surgical with an annuloplasty or we can also do transcatheter uh, repair and replacement. And there we got a lot of possibilities coming. We're not going to talk about all of that. Today we're going to talk mostly about LV function size, coronary disease, and severe mitral regurgitation. Why is this ejection fraction so important? You see that here illustrated on this uh, picture. If we see when the ejection fraction goes down from 40 to 30 to 20, then the mortality goes up steeply, as you can see in this curve. This is an old one. This curve comes from a friend of mine, R.V. White, published in the New England Journal in 1986. But basically, this is still true, because if we give all our heart failure medication, these patients eventually get worse, and eventually they will die. So lower ejection fraction, as soon as it approaches 25, maybe 20% patients die. We cannot easily keep them alive. So how do we measure LV function and size? This is actually our patient that we talked about. On the upper left, you see that he has had an inferior infarction. Can you actually see my arrow when I move that? Oh, I can take this one here. Um, I can do this one. Do you see this one well? Yeah, okay. So this yes, is our yes. patient. He has an inferior infarction, has a very big ventricle. He also has an anthroseptal infarction, as you can see. And you see also that it's not so easy to see here because the ventricle is big, so this part we cannot see. And so what we do, we use a lot of this intravenous contrast, which is very simple to give. It's a venous um uh, admission, you give it, it's a venous, uh, transvenous injection. And then the contrast travels into the left ventricle. Why do we like it? Because we can see so much better, as you see here, where the ventricular wall is and how the function is. So this here shows immediately the benefit of that because I see a thrombus 
at the apex. Many of these patients actually have a thrombus at the apex. When you open them up for aneurysmectomy, for example, you almost always see an, a thrombus at the apex. But what I'm going to is that giving contrast is very important for better opacification of the endocardial borders. Therefore, you can better assess what the function is and you can also pick up thrombi like this one. We have moved largely from two-dimensional echocardiography to three-dimensional echocardiography. And this is done with one probe and it's only one picture. And automatically he captures the two, the three, and the four or five, the two, the four, and the three or five chamber. And you can get them all at the same beat. And then you see here this dotted lines, there it comes, you see. That is automatic contour detection. And from that, he calculates from these three views immediately the LV volume as it is in systole and diastole. And from that, we can very easily assess the ejection fraction. So we're moving away from 2D imaging to 3D imaging. And if you combine the 3D with contrast, as you see here, you can perfectly assess the left ventricular ejection fraction. Of course, this is much more beautiful. This is an MRI. I see here the two chamber view. This is the atrium, mitral valve in between. I see here the four chamber view. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle, papillary muscle here. You see the left atrium, pulmonary veins. You see the right atrium. Or we can take a short axis view. You see here the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Of course, an MRI is much more beautiful and it gives us much more detailed information. But if we talk about every heart failure patient needs an echo or needs an image, then you intuitively feel that echo is probably the best because it's simple, no radiation, no waiting time. You can do 100 per day if you have a good echo lab. We do about 150 echoes per day. And so MRI is good, but it's not that practical and it's also not widely available. We do 150 echoes per day, so maybe... I don't know, five, six, maybe 800 plus 900 per, per week. And um, um, we can never do 900 MRIs per week. So first choice is an echocardiogram. We can also do a CT scan nowadays. And you see here, this is the left ventricle. And this here's the right ventricle. Image quality is pretty good, right? This is a non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. You see a little bit of a step artifact there, but otherwise you can see the papillary muscles there. So it's not bad, but a CT comes with a lot of radiation. And if you do a ventricular scan as this, this comes with radiation maybe, I would say eight millisieverts. So there's way too much to do that in every patient. So the point I'm making, LV function and size is important. Our main tool is echo. If you can have access to it, I like to have it with contrast. We need highest resolution images in every patient. We need assessment of ejection fraction, but also of volumes and systolic volume and diastolic volume. And what is also still very important is simple dimensions. The simple dimensions, they give us a very good view on how big or how small the ventricle is. The assessment of ejection fraction, volumes and dimensions is important for prognosis because the bigger the heart is, the worse the outcome is. But we also use it a lot to justify an ICD. And this patient has ischemic cardiomyopathy, has had previous infarctions, and he has a very poor ejection fraction. So he's the ideal candidate for an ICD. And you saw in my introduction that actually he had already a history of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. There are other ways to assess LV function. This is a derivative from routine echo. 
This is called strain. I'm not sure if you use that a lot, but we use it in every patient almost nowadays. And this is the longitudinal strain. Here you see the left ventricle. Here is the right ventricle. Here's the tricuspid valve, as you see. Here's the mitral valve, as you see, left atrium and right atrium. This strain displays or reflects the up and down motion, the up and down motion. That is called the longitudinal strain. And for every different color here, we can measure that strain. And we see here that all these different colors are reflected in this picture and they come all at the same time. This is the peak strain for every of those segments. The dotted bar, the dotted uh, line is actually the average of all the segments. Let's go a little bit further. That probe that I showed you where I can do a two chamber view and a four chamber view and a three or a five chamber view in one acquisition. I can do the same for strain, two chamber strain, four chamber strain and three or five chamber strain. From these three, the computer makes this bullseye plot for you, just like a nuclear scan. This is the apex. This here is where the septum is. This is anterior, lateral, posterior, inferior. Apex and the most basal parts of the ventricle. Now, you see this red thing coming here and that has a number there and it says minus 20. Forget about the minus. The minus is just a definition. But what you see reflected here of this whole heart is the up and down deformation. And that's what we call longitudinal, global longitudinal strain. And that is a normal value for a normal patient of minus 19, minus 20. If we look at an acute infarction as this here, this is an acute inferior posterior infarct has a strain of 13, 14. And this is a chronic heart failure patient where all the strain is gone because red is normal, pink is in between and blue is really completely gone. And this has a strain of seven. So looking from zero to 20, normals about 20, acute infarctions about 15, and heart failure around five, six, seven. Then you get a feeling for what these strains mean. We've spoken so far about LV function and size. I've taken you from ejection fraction towards strain. My belief is that in the near future, everybody will eventually do this strain. It's a much sharper and more precise and more accurate uh, reflector than ejection fraction. Let me give you one example. If this patient of mine here has a severe mitral regurgitation, then his ejection fraction is maybe 25%. But half of that volume is not going through the aorta. Half of that volume is leaking back through the mitral valve with mitral regurgitation in the left atrium. But that calculates for the ejection fraction because the ejection fraction doesn't look if it goes forward or backward. It takes everything that leaves the ventricle independent of what way. And that is if you have a patient with severe reduced function and severe mitral regurgitation, the ejection fraction is overestimating what that function of the ventricle really is. And if you then do a strain, you get a much better idea what it really is, because that only measures the deformation of the muscle of the ventricle. Let's go on to the next part. We want to know, does our patient have coronary disease? Does he have ischemia? Does he have viability? Do I need to revascularize? We know that our patient has coronary disease because he has a previous bypass and he has previous infarctions. So he has coronary artery disease. But if we don't know and we see that patient for the first time, then I'm not gonna mess around with any imaging. I'll do immediately an angiogram so that I have a good idea what is going on in these coronary arteries. 
So severe heart failure patient is stabilized, comes with a reduced ejection fraction, if possible, immediately look at the coronary arteries. We use a lot nowadays this new technology. This is a CT scan. Here is the left ventricle. This is the liver. And here's the aorta and you see all that calcium in the coronary arteries. I'm gonna run it one more time. This is the left ventricle. Liver, aorta and coronary arteries full of calcium. What you see very well in the CT is the calcified atherosclerosis. So with a CT, I can also easily assess non-invasively if that patient has coronary disease. You're gonna ask me in this severe heart failure patient, are you then also doing a CT scan? I'm gonna say no. In severe heart failure, we still do immediately an invasive angiogram because we wanna know precisely if there's anything that we can revascularize. Now that we know that the patient has coronary disease, our next question is, is there jeopardized myocardium that we could revascularize? So yes, we do, for example, a nuclear stress test, a perfusion spec study. This is the resting result. And this is the, sorry, this is the stress result here. And this here is the resting result. There is a perfusion defect at stress here here and here. If I calculate in this whole ventricle how much perfusion defect I have, I can plot it like this. So this person here has about 30% perfusion defect. That's why this polar plot is so useful. My next question is, I know that he has reduced perfusion but is a large area of that uh, hypoperfused myocardium still alive? Is it useful to revascularize? Now, this is the scan from our patient. And you see here that he has almost no perfusion left in the short axis. Only the lateral wall still has perfusion. You see that? Only there and a little bit septum and lateral wall here. But if I do FDG, which is F18, radioactive uh, glucose, I see that he has much more metabolism left. Take this example, for example, here is that, later, is that um, um, lateral wall, but here's the septum and all that septum has, has glucose uptake, but it has almost no perfusion. And that's the classical situation that uh, Sabu Rahim Tula once called hibernation. There is a very, very low flow in this area, but the metabolism is still there. Normally, a heart uses free fatty acids for metabolism, but he can only use free fatty acids if he has enough oxygen to burn it. But once you have so low perfusion as this here, there is not enough oxygen. So the heart switches to anaerobic metabolism. And because of anaerobic, he start to burn glucose, which yield much less energy. And therefore the heart stays alive, but it hardly contracts, it stops its contraction. And that is where the term hibernation comes from. We have now looked at LV function and size. We have spoken about ischemia and viability. And now we're gonna talk the next step, does our patient have severe mitral regurgitation? Well, we heard it already with the stethoscope, right? We know that severe mitral regurgitation, this is a patient without mitral regurgitation, and this is the patient with mitral regurgitation. And we see, because here is survival, that the patients without mitral regurgitation do much better than the patients with mitral regurgitation. You know that from your clinics. If that patient has severe mitral regurgitation, his outcome is worse. And we need to think about, I'm gonna do bypass surgery on him. Should I repair the mitral valve? So the question is, does he have severe mitral regurgitation? This is our patient again, and very simple echo. Here you see the same picture, the four chamber, remember? And he has the big infarct in the septum, the apex, partially lateral wall. You see the severe mitral regurgitation going down in the atrium. 
And this is a transesophageal. And you see actually severe mitral regurgitation going into the atrium. So what do we do to assess the mitral regurgitation easily? We do transthoracic and if needed, transesophageal echo. Why would we do a transesophageal echo? To better understand the geometry of the mitral valve so that we can think about, is this patient good for surgery of the valve as well? So do we need to just look at the pictures or do we need to quantify that mitral regurgitation severity? That's the question. This one has a good survival in yellow. This one has a no good survival in red. And what it says here is ERO, that is effective regurgitant orifice, or in other words, the leaking hole where the mitral valve is no longer closing and the blood is leaking. So that effective regurgitant orifice is it's small, the leaking hole, you have less mitral regurgitation, outcome is better. If the leaking hole is big in the mitral valve, the outcome is significantly worse. So yes, we want to quantify that mitral regurgitation to better understand what the prognosis of this patient is gonna be. We have been working with this new stuff. This is an MRI. Here you see right atrium, left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle. And here you see the moving pictures of that. And you see the pictures of all the valves, mitral valve, tricuspid valve, aortic valve in the other one, and even pulmonic valve. So here is the mitral and the tricuspid. Here is the aortic valve, and here's the pulmonary valve. What you see here is flow uh, velocity coded imaging. And so what you see over that valve, you see it open and close and you see the blood flow through it. And that we can measure for every valve. Let's take a look what it looks like. Here I take out now the mitral valve, is that mitral? And you see here the pattern of the blood flow over that valve. This is ENA ratio, right? So the forward flow is 116. The backward flow is 32. So my regurgitation fraction is 27%. By definition, this one is much more accurate than an echocardiogram. We do this only if we have doubts about the severity of the mitral regurgitation, because again, we don't have that much MRI capacity. So we use it for the ones where we really need it. We have now discussed these three, LV function, size, coronary disease, ischemia viability, and severe mitral regurgitation. Based on this, we can handle most of the patients. We need complex information to determine an individualized therapy. We can provide that by multimodality imaging. I've shown you a little bit, a lot of echo, a little bit of CT, and a little bit of MRI, and some nuclear. You can, based on this information that you're getting, you can precisely target your patient. What we did with this patient, we did a resurgery on his coronaries. We did a fixing of the mitral valve and he got an ICD. Now I'm gonna stop this part. Let me see what time it is, yeah. I'm gonna stop this part. And first I'm gonna turn on the electricity. Give me one second. So that I'm not losing the computer halfway when we're yeah. talking. And we're going to go now to another part. Because the next generation of patients, the ones that are coming now, that you see from day to day in your patient practice, is not that much heart failure reduced infection fraction, but the new ones, they have a new disease. It's mostly these elderly women that have atrial fibrillation, that have hypertension, hypertrophy, uh, and they present with something else. So heart failure and echocardiography, how to assess LV function, we just discussed. We talk about left ventricular ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced, reduced ejection fraction. But what should I measure in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Not because my ejection fraction is normal, but still something is not good because that patient has symptoms, 
and they also don't live that long. At the moment, we have only one medication that's doing something, which is Entresto, which has been approved for women with an ejection fraction more than 60%. We're going to talk here a little bit about why, why is this ejection fraction normal and what is going on with the patient? How can I measure it? So we need other parameters of systolic and diastolic function. Now we're gonna look at a couple of examples. This is the first one that I showed to you. This is a 21 year old man who used anthracycline for lymphatic leukemia. You see here his echoes, two chamber, four chamber, three or five chamber. His function looks good, right? Looks perfect. Here is now this global longitudinal strain that I've been talking about to you. I told you that 20 is normal. His ejection fraction is perfect, 60%, nothing wrong. But the global strain is 18. And you see here in this pinkish, this part here, that there is already reduction in strain. Let's take another one. Amyloidosis. Very typical picture, right, of the amyloid patient here. Very thickened walls. His ejection fraction is 66%. When we look at the strain patterns, the first thing that we see is that the apex is really spared. That has a normal strain. They also call it the cherry, uh, cherry on the top or something, I don't know. But this is the typical picture of amyloidosis. The apex is spared, but the rest is absolutely not good, right? So his global strain is 11%. That's significantly reduced, but his ejection fraction is normal. This is the next one. This is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He has an ejection fraction of 65%. I took on purpose a very extensive example. You see here that is almost kissing uh, the septum to the lateral wall, very, very hypertrophied. And this is the two chamber view with the inferior and the anterior, very, very hypertrophied. Ejection fraction, perfect, 65%. If I look at his strain, look at this here, 8.1 only. And you see that here all over the place, it's reduced. Another one, cardiac sarcoidosis. This patient's ejection fraction is 62%. Echo looks good, right? A little bit thickened walls. If we do the MRI, we see typically the areas of fibrosis. This is the short axis, and this is the long axis. These whitish areas, these are the areas of fibrosis. Fibrosis in the cardiac sarcoidosis. These are old areas of inflammation. They're not acutely inflamed, inflamed, but normal muscle is being replaced for fibrosis or scar tissue, if you like. His strain, 17.7%. is not that bad, but it's also not normal. This is the last one. This is not one that you would expect, but it's aortic stenosis. Doesn't have cancer, just has simple aortic stenosis. 83-year-old woman, severe AS, has an aortic valve area 0.9, has a mean gradient of 60, ejection fraction of 62. You see the hypertrophied septum there? The global strain is 13. We spoke about normal is 20, has 13. That means that it's absolutely not good. And you see here in the heart that at this septum area that the strain is gone, right? Because this is the reddish, that's normal strain. Septal, where the hypertrophy is, is gone. This is where the right ventricle inserts, you see? So this is the septum. I've given you quite some examples where you have a perfectly normal ejection fraction, but your strain is gone. And we could speak about this diastolic problems, but we could also see the systolic dimension from very high to normal to very, very low to not normal. And then 20 we know is normal. And then when you go lower, when you have more fibrosis, that can happen in end stage heart failure, like we saw in the first patient. But that can also happen in diastolic failure where fibrosis forms. And this is the heart failure 
with preserved ejection fraction. Now you understand where I'm going. I'm saying in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we cannot measure an ejection fraction because it's normal. But if we do that strain, it gives us good information. Understand why the strain is reduced. I put there in white, abnormal function is the consequence of abnormal anatomy. What is the abnormal anatomy? That is the fibrosis in the heart. So we have anatomical imaging where we can visualize or assess the fibrosis. And we have functional imaging where we can measure the consequences on ventricular function of the fibrosis. More fibrosis, worse function. Assessing fibrosis, these are the patterns of fibrosis. This here, this is blood vessels, and these are the myocytes. And in between there, this whitish, bluish, that is the areas of fibrosis. This here is reactive interstitial fibrosis. When do we have reactive interstitial fibrosis? With hypertension, with diabetes, with valve disease, uh, with aging, all of those that I showed you in the previous example. If we go here, this is big fibrosis and we see the myocytes still, but in between the myocytes, there is all this fibrosis. And now we call it scar formation because it's confluent and it's big and we can see it on an MRI. MRI is a great tool. This is normal myocardium, where you see the myocytes in purple, and I see the blood vessels in red, and there is no interstitial much myocardium. There are some here, some there, some over there. So there is interstitial tissue, but not that much. And this is the normal situation. If I do a delayed enhancement for big scar tissue, I see nothing. Because delayed enhancement, you know that that gives these white spots like we saw in the sarcoidosis patient, but I don't see anything. This is a perfectly normal heart, it looks like. And this is my T1 mapping. And just look here. The only thing I want you to look at is the extracellular volume, ECV, is 24%. This is a normal heart, the first one. The normal heart has 20% fibrosis, extracellular volume. This is the diffuse reactive interstitial fibrosis, reacting to all these diseases that I just showed you in these examples with echo. And look here, there is a lot of fibrosis coming now. You see much more than over here. There is still no big scar. My delayed enhancement is still perfectly black, but my extracellular volume has now gone up. It's 32%. So it's increasing, there's more diffuse reactive fibrosis. I'm gonna to go to the last one now where you see big scar coming, big fibrosis, right? All the myocytes here are gone. And here I see now in white on my delayed enhancement that something is happening. There is big scar formation. If I look at the T1 map, it has gone up big time now because now it's almost 40%. So I go from normal to some fibrosis, to big scar. Let's put that in some structure now. This is the parameter that I'm looking at, extracellular volume or late gadolinium enhancement. The late gadolinium enhancement is the pure white scar on the MRI. The extracellular volume I do not see. So if I have normal myocardium, I have a normal extracellular volume, and I have no late enhancement. I have none of that white tissue that you saw on the MRI. The earlier diseases, they have reactive fibrosis. My extracellular volume increases, like I showed you on the T1 mapping, but my late gadolinium does not increase at all. Extracellular volume, I measure with the T1 mapping, so it's increased. Now I go to the replacement fibrosis. This is the big scar. My extracellular volume is now going up big, 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 as I showed you in the last patient. And now I start to see late gadolinium enhancement. So what I'm saying to you is that extracellular volume, there is some in the normal tissue, 
there is more in the fibrosis and there is big time when there is scar. Late gadolinium is not in normal, is not in reactive fibrosis, but the white late gadolinium I see when there becomes replacement fibrosis, such as an old myocardial infarction. Many of us, including me, cannot do every day so many MRIs, and still I wanna know. So just focus on these two pictures here. This is my normal echo from which I can measure an ejection fraction. This is my strain, and I showed to you that in this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, preserved normal ejection fraction, I can measure abnormal strain. I have the same uh, display as we had before. Do not look at this row. Do not look at the top row. So normal myocardium has a normal global strain and has a normal ejection fraction. Once my patient develops reactive fibrosis, he has a reduced strain, but he still has a normal ejection fraction. This is all these examples that I showed to you. Once the patient gets a big infarction, the strain goes down big time and ejection fraction goes down as well. We could say, this is probably heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We could say, this is probably diastolic heart failure. We could say this is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or we could say heart failure with a lost ejection fraction. So reactive fibrosis, all these diseases that I showed you, diastolic dysfunction, the strain is down, the ejection fraction is normal. Replacement fibrosis scar formation, the strain is down big time, and my ejection fraction is now reduced. This was my last slide. I have tried to show you that in reduced heart failure ejection fraction, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the first patient, you measure a lot of things. We measure the ejection fraction, we look at the valves, we look at the tissue, we've discussed all that. The new disease is the one on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is normal, Still, my patient has heart failure. In the past, we used to call that diastolic dysfunction. Probably that's still a very good terminology, but we understand it better now because with this novel MRI and the derived global strain, we can see and measure the reactive fibrosis. I still have a normal ejection fraction. Still, the patient has heart failure. So he has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But if I run my global strain, or I do my MRI, then I see that that is not normal. So normal ejection fraction, but a reduced strain is probably all these diseases that we're talking about, this epidemic of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I ask myself, why did we not see all these patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction, let's say 10 years ago, let's say maybe eight years ago? Because these patients were referred to the echo lab and the patient was dyspneic, but we couldn't measure anything. Ejection fraction was normal, so end of the story. Referral to the lung physician, probably something with the lungs. Now we understand much better that a lot of these patients that have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, when you measure your echo and your strain is reduced, then you know that something is wrong, although ejection fraction is still normal. I hope I explained a little bit clear. I took you to this uh, travel from uh, reduced ejection fraction to preserved ejection fraction. And I wanna thank you very much for your attention. And I deeply apologize that I fell asleep the first time that I was supposed to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Bax. Uh, it is very interesting and uh, beneficial lecture for us. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Abbas, uh, introduce yes. Dr. Yes. Nazar for the next lecture. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jeroen Bax, for a very interesting lecture. Thank you again. Uh, the, now, the second speaker is Dr. Nazar Hassan Isa, Sudani, is a well known figure in cardiology, senior consultant in Nasriya Heart Center. He will be present at topic title, A New Therapy for the Treatment of Heart Failure, a Summary of Recent Accomplishment. 
Formal Dr. Neza, welcome. Okay. Dr. Can we stop sharing? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor. Is it Dr. okay Nezar, if I watch a little bit with the next talk? Yes, yes. Dr. Nazar, start sharing. Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> is it clear? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, it's clear. Yes, it's clear. Thank you very much for this invitation to have this chance to uh, have this talk. Uh, really, after the great talk of uh, Professor Pax, I thank him a lot for this great talk about the uh, spectrum of heart failure from half ref to half bef And especially his talk about the half bef <laughs> We all know that in the previous days, uh, is it clear? The voice is it clear? Yes, clear, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the camera uh, open. Okay. Yeah, okay. Welcome. The camera is on. Oh. Yeah, looks good. Oh. Okay. Uh, good. Okay. Really, I great thanks for you, Professor Pax. The, we all know that the 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 preserved heart failure with the preserved ejection fraction was really a matter of debate, and uh, uh, some bodies they told that this is just a. Uh, an expectation or just a, uh, it is not a real thing. But now I realize that it is really a, a, an, an important subject to be tackled, especially with the development of new modalities in the imaging, especially in the uh, development in the eco. Anyhow, my talk is just uh, about the half rough. Uh, and I apologize for the uh, title because I thought that it is more important to concentrate on the well-established treatment to have some review and some uh, emphasize on some important points and to have some uh, idea about the possible new pharmaceutical agent or classes in, in this aspect. Uh, the uh, cornerstone of guideline directed medical therapy for half rath as we know, in involved inhibition of the renin angiotensin aldosterone and sympathetic nervous system, the augmentation of favorable pathway like nebrilisin and, 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 and nebrilisin, and uh, 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 evabradine as a pacemaker uh, inhibitor of pacemaker activity and uh, vasodilator like hydralazine, isosorbide, dinitrate. Uh, and uh, a more recent uh, uh, reduction in cardiovascular events and mortality was noticed with some agents, new agents in this field, like the uh, SGL2 inhibitor, dabigloflozine, and other, and uh, an, uh, an, uh, a versiquat, an oral soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. Uh, According to the guidelines, which is really not uh, the most updated guidelines, this is DSC uh, 2016. This figure, we can see how we can uh, go for the treatment stepwise. Patients with symptomatic heart rate started, should be started on AC inhibitors and beta blockers should be titrated up to the maximum tolerated evidence-based doses. System symptomatic and the ejection fraction is less than 35. We have to add minoralocorticoid antagonist and should be also titrated for the up maximum uh, tolerated doses. If it's still symptomatic and the EF is less than 35, then one should think of shifting the patients to the new class in this field, the uh, angiotensin receptor inhibitor, nebrisin inhibitor, ARNI group, 
and uh, those with uh, why the QRS should be evaluated for the need of CRT and those with a sinus rhythm and a heart rate of more than 70 despite maximum beta blocker should be uh, started on evabradine. And uh, these above treatment may be uh, combined if indicated and resistant symptoms. Inotropic agent, digoxine, hydralazine, isosorbide nitrate, left ventricular assist device or the final destination heart transplantation. And along all this uh, treatment strategy, diuretics, of course, to improve symptoms and those with reduced ejection fraction below 35 on optimal medical therapy should be also evaluated for implantation of ICD. The American guideline, almost the same story uh, uh, in the stepwise treatment of half uh, according to the stage of the disease. And always we have to emphasize that we should offer our patients the maximal tolerated doses of this uh, medical, uh, of this guided guideline directed medical therapy to get the most of benefits. The registry sorry, have shown that uh, more than, this is in, uh, in real life, that more than quarter, one quarter of eligible patients are not prescribed the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or the ARBs or uh, the, uh, the new class, the ARB. And more than one third are not a prescribed beta blocker, more than one half are not a prescribed minor allocorticoid receptor antagonist. And even when prescribed, the doses are below recommended target, despite evidence that doses below target level are associated with poorer outcome. One percent only of eligible patients are simultaneously prescribed target doses of all three classes, one percent only. So the true uh, that our patients are really under-treated. Regarding AC inhibitor, of course, it more than 34 years uh, with a lot of trials that uh, shows that this, this class of medication are important. Uh, uh, they have uh, reduced all-cause mortality in the range of 20 to 30%. Of course, there are some precautions in, in, in regard of the low blood pressure, in regard of the chronic kidney disease, uh, when a creatinine of more than three, uh, hyperkalemia with a potassium more than 5.5 5 .5, uh, milli equivalent per liter. And this therapy should be avoided in patients with pregnant and who are planned to become pregnant or have a bilateral renal artery stenosis. 20% of patients treated with HC inhibitors develop a dry cough, which is related to accumulation of radicinine and is uh, not dose dependent and is a class effect to all HC inhibitors. Both ACE and ARBs are less than 1% risk of angioedema and contraindication in patients uh, with this complication. Regarding ARNI, it is a rather new class uh, of the uh, of the RAS, uh, of the uh, of these agents, uh, the renin angiotensin system, it acts on dual pathway. One is on the uh, the uh, renin angiotensin uh, inhibitor through the valsartan component, and with the reducing uh, renin angiotensin system activity, we have to we, we are we 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 achieve a, a, a decrease in sodium and water retention, decrease in vasoconstriction, and decrease in hypertrophy and fibrosis. The other arm of this class is the neprilicine. The, by neprilicine inhibition, uh, neprilicine is an enzyme that uh, acts to degrade the, the beneficial vasoactive peptides, like atrial nitroreactive peptide or brain nitroreactive peptide. So by enhancing this natriuretic peptide system, 
we can uh, we, we achieve a better uh, uh, more nitri nitriuresis and diuresis aldosterone suppression vasodilatation and inhibition of fibrosis so uh, this call uh, this uh, beneficial effect would have a, a better outcome on our heart failure patients There is an, uh, the, the first trial that uh, studied this uh, uh, new class of medication was the, uh, the Baradim trial, which was a multi-center uh, trial that recruited a lot of patients, uh, more than 8,000 patients uh, with a long follow-up, uh, was comparing the, uh, uh, the uh, Entristo to uh, in April in patients with, est with established diagnosis of heart failure. And we can see that uh, during follow-up, an early separation of the, of the two line of in April and uh, the new uh, drug, uh, Valsartan, Nebrilicin, and uh, Sacchiobitril, uh, uh, and use and uh, uh, favoring of uh, a better outcome with the uh, with this, uh, with this medication in form of the uh, cardiovascular death or uh, hospitalization, which was the primary endpoint of the study. And really the study was ended earlier than it, what it should be because it meets the requirement early in the course of the study. The, uh, the effect of this group was uh, extended and those with uh, presented with a with, uh, with acute decompensated heart failure. And this was in the pioneer heart failure study. So uh, again, the primary endpoint was uh, better in regard of uh, hospitalization, worsening of uh, renal function, symptomatic high, uh, sorry, rehospitalization re uh, was again uh, better with a drug with a, with a significant P value. And in, they conclude that Sacchiobitril Valsartan reduced the nitric, uh, the NT and the pro PNV more than in April among patients with acute decompensated heart failure noted as early as one week after initiation of treatment. Although it is not powered for a clinical endpoints, but a reduction in hospitalization of heart failure was noted in this study. Uh, another study, the, the transition uh, study, trying to uh, also uh, to, uh, 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 to settle whether uh, initiation of treatment and the decompensated failure uh, is safe and its efficacy, and whether it is initiated in hospital or later on. So again, uh, the uh, the drug found it is be feasible and well tolerated if initiated during the decompensated during the uh, uh, initial hospitalization of such patients. The uh, proof, uh, proof it heart failure, uh, the proof uh, the proof HF study, the prospective study of biomarker symptom improvement and ventricular remodeling during interest therapy for heart failure. This study found that the magnitude of improvement in measurement of cardiac structure and function was consistent across the subgroups. In this group, they tried to extend the group of the, the, uh, the Baradim trial, uh, which, uh, which was involving those patients with a certain level of pro PNP. So with this trial, they found that the benefit is still for those who are at a lower PNP level than the uh, patients involved in the Aladdin trial. Uh, they, they, they try to extend the benefit of uh, this drug to patients with half birth, those with a preserved ejection fraction. So they enroll patients with an ejection fraction of 45% or more. This is in the Baragon heart failure trial. They conclude that also they get benefit of this medication. 
from the safety standpoint, patients are at increased risk of uh, patients who are started with army. They are at more risk of symptomatic hypertension, angioedema, uh, uh, and, and biodem heart failure. 2.7% of patients with symptomatic hypertension, systolic blood pressure below 90, and 0.4% develop angioedema. Therefore, patients with low blood pressure are, are less likely to tolerate army. Um, uh, contraindications applied to ARBs and ACE inhibitors are also applied to ARNI. Beta blockers are well known class for treatment of half rap patients, but should be in the evidence based beta blocker, which are the metoprolol succinate, the carbidolol, and the bisoprolol. They should be prescribed to all patients with half rough and less contraindication or not tolerated like patients with symptomatic bradycardia or despite a lower dose or those with advanced heart failure and the low cardiac output confirmed by right heart cut. And those, of course, with uh, uh, high grade AV blocks. These agents reduce all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, sudden cardiac death and hospitalization. And it has been studied extensively with a lot of trials, many trials, uh, in total of 10, 18,000, more than 18,000 patients, all shows that the beneficial effect of beta blocker on reducing all cause mortality in half rough patients who were in normal sinus rhythm. But also, patients with half rough and AF, they, although the guidelines recommend use, uh, although it's, it's not well studied in the, uh, in, the, in the previous trials, but still the guidelines recommend use of beta blockers irrespective of heart rhythm because of the uh, great benefits in terms of uh, the uh, cardiovascular mortality and uh, hospitalization. So uh, uh, beta blocker should be indicated even in atrial fibrillation patients. Regarding the minor anocorticoid receptor antagonists, pyronolactone and epirinone also contribute to renin angiotensin aldosterone system blockage, reduce mortality, mortality by 15% to 30%, uh, and reduce hospitalization by 15 to 40%. And uh, also was uh, tackled in different in three randomized clinical trials. Uh, the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist should be added to therapy along with the AC inhibitor and uh, and or ARNI and beta blockers in patients with uh, EF less than 35. And of course, symptomatic NIA two to four. Of course, the precaution here is uh, those with renal impairment and those with uh, hyperkalemia. Regarding evabradine, evabradine inhibits pacemaker activity in the sinoatrial node by selectively blocking the honey channels current, resulting in a slower heart rate in sinus rhythm without affecting the blood pressure, myocardial contractility, and intracardiac conduction. The, uh, the trial that addressed this uh, drug is the shifted trial systolic heart failure treatment with uh, I and with the functional inhibitor evabradine trial. Uh, it shows that reduced hospitalization, reduced heart failure and hospitalization and mortality benefit. But but the all-cause all mortality compared with a placebo was not, was not benefited by this drug. Patients treated with evabradine had an average reduction in heart rate of eight beats per minute, whereas in meta-analysis beta blocker in patients with half ref heart rate reduced by 12 uh, uh, beats per minute. So, always evabradine should be an add-on treatment and should only be given as the patients 
is already on maximum tolerated doses, but the heart rate could not achieve below 70. So uh, this Dr. patient- Dr. Nazar, yeah. uh, I think we have some shortage of time. How many slides that you have? Okay, I, I will try to. Hmm. Yes. I try to emphasize on that the, uh, the, the, this treatment option, hydrazine, uh, isosorbide dinitrate, although many trials uh, address it in the black people, but uh, as the guideline mentioned, it can be an add-on treatment for those who are still symptomatic on full uh, AC inhibitors and IRBs, and also it can substitute these agents in patients with renal, uh, with chronic kidney disease. We can't replace this group because it is contraindicated with hydralazine isosorbide. Although also it has a mortality benefit and uh, hospitalization reduction. Uh, regarding the new drug therapies, uh, which appears in, uh, and uh, probably it will be introduced in the guidelines, in the next guidelines, the, the SGL2 inhibitors. The, there was a great, uh, a large trial, the DAVA HF trial, that uh, after the observation that these, these agents is beneficial for uh, patients who are diabetic and heart failure, they, they try to expand this on patients who are who, with heart failure with or without diabetic. And the result, were, uh, the result was uh, showing that uh, it has a cardiovascular uh, mortality uh, reduction and all-cause mortality reduction. And uh, the trial, as we shown here, the, uh, the, there is a great separation and early separation in the two arm placebo versus dabiglaftosine uh, in, in regard of cardiovascular death, hospitalization, and urgent uh, heart failure, uh, visit for heart failure. Uh, also, another trial uh, on uh, uh, another agent, embagliflozine, uh, also showing a beneficial effect of this medication. So probably it is not related to uh, dabigliflozine and it is a class effect for this agent. Uh, another agent uh, which is a, a new class in this field is the uh, Versiquat, which is an oral soluble guanylate cyclase Stimulator that increase activity of the, uh, the the final effect is the increasing the cyclic GMP and this could improve the uh, calcium concentration in, in, in the muscle and it had uh, an, uh, an important beneficial effect uh, decrease arterial constriction decrease vascular stiffness uh, and, uh, decrease uh, myocardial stiffness and decrease myocardial thickening decrease ventricular remodeling, probably decrease fibrosis, and is shown by uh, trial. And we can see uh, uh, that is the, 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 the trial is more beneficial in, uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of all-cause mortality and hospitalization. So, uh, so I want to concentrate just in a few slides that we have to go for the maximum tolerated doses. We have to offer our patients the maximum tolerated doses as uh, settled by the guidelines. And uh, uh, because using lower guidelines, lower doses would have a poorer uh, patient outcome. And uh, they, they, they also, the guidelines re-emphasize that patients with AC inhibitors probably is more beneficial to be shifted on uh, the new class, the if they are, uh, if their, their blood pressure can tolerate. And this is a stepwise uh, uh, figure to stepwise uh, treatment for those patients with heart failure, uh, which is, again, we emphasize that uh, we can switch to ARNI and uh, adding the uh, minor allocorticoid receptor antagonist, adding evabradine, adding hydralazine uh, isosorbide dinitrate. Uh, so we have to uh, 
offer our patients whatever possible treatment that might give him benefit. So uh, we have to concentrate that therapeutic inertia on behalf of the patient or a clinician where there may be reluctance to titrate or add therapies in patients who appear to be doing well on current treatment. We have to concentrate that if any patient is doing well on his treatment and his doses, we have to up titrate to the maximal tolerated doses, even if the patient is well. So some of the questions that uh, might be uh, asked by colleagues uh, uh, or the patient. Well, first of all, which, which treatment should I start? Beta blocker or IC inhibitor first? Beta blocker should not be newly initiated in those with congestion until the congestion is relieved. Stable patients, who do not have significant congestion, borderline blood pressure or frality can be started on both beta block. So the situation, it will uh, judge which treatment is to be started, beta blocker, IC inhibitors. Patient with congestion, we have to postpone AC beta blocker until uh, the congestion is relieved then to be started, whether during hospitalization or thereafter. And patients who are hypotensive, more likely, less tolerant to IC inhibitors. So we have to balance this according to the situation. So what should I uptight rate first, beta blocker or IC inhibitor? Again, depends on the degree of congestion, the heart rate, and the kidney function. Okay. How quickly should I uptight rate my treatment? Patient, beta blocker should be titrated no more frequently than once every one to two weeks uh, in stable patients. Army can be titrated weekly in those with good blood pressure and every two to four weeks in those with low blood pressure. What level of kidney dysfunction should I stop AC inhibitor or ARNI? Decrease e e e GFR more than 30% of the development or the development of hyperkalemia should prompt consideration of dose reduction. When should I repeat the transthoracic echo? Should be repeated after three to six months of the guideline directed medical therapy and optimization so the patient with a progressive now. Uh, now. Okay. Uh, I mind if I address a few, few notes, yeah, and a few notes uh, because this are important for us and for the patients. Okay. Uh, uh, what the matters to discuss with the patients? Uh, and, uh, we have to discuss the patients about the uh, substantial oppor opportunity of improvement that they, that they will improve on treatment and their quality li li life will improve, but they should, they should stuck with the treatment, not stopping the treatment and uh, we have to titrate up the doses, as I mentioned. Regarding the exercise, we have to encourage the patients about regular aerobic exercise, sufficient to provoke mild to, mild to moderate breathlessness to improve functional capacity. And this will reduce hospitalization risk. Regarding sodium and water intake, moderate sodium restriction is reasonable for symptomatic patients and fluid restriction, uh, one, uh, one and a half to two liter per day. Uh, regarding the self-management strategies provided patients with individual formation, such as increase their diuretic use, uh, they can increase their diuretic or decrease their diuretic according to the congestion, according to the symptoms. We have to encourage them about receiving vaccination, the annual influenza vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, and uh, cessation of smoking and alcohol use. So I will stop here because we have a short of time. We have some investigational and novel treatment uh, under, uh, under uh, trials now. Uh, probably it will play a role in the future treatment of half rap patients. And sorry for these slides and thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nizar. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, yes.
Dr. Giron, you can answer most of the question. Professor Giron, Dr. Mohammed, that girl. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much for the for the these lectures. Uh, great thanks for Professor Jerome Bax uh, to yes. for his time, effort, and this interesting uh, lecture. Uh, we uh, are grateful for him, and uh, th uh, thank you uh, very much again, uh, Professor. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're very welcome, and I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed very much the lecture by Dr. Nazar. Um, what he presented is exactly the way we practice. Um, we use a lot nowadays Entresto, really a lot, yes. because um, some patients where I had absolutely no success with Entresto, it's doing quite well. SDLT2s, yes. we start SDLT2, we start also use more and more. And uh, Virisigward is something where we do not have yet that much experience, but Virisigward is the one that is probably for the worst patients, because if you look at the trials, Virisigward were the patients with the lowest ejection fractions. And yes. um, they were also the ones with, they entered the study with a worsening heart failure event. So it's probably the best drug in um, when patients do not respond to therapy and they present several times with new worsening heart failure, which means uh, uh, decompensated heart failure, hospitalization, etc. So I, I think all three of those drugs have a very important position in the treatment of heart failure. And I think you explained it very, very clear also when to up titrate, when not to up titrate. And uh, what I personally learned is with the Entresto, Sometimes you feel that hmm, the blood pressure is a little bit low, but they can still handle it. So um, I'm surprised by how often if the blood pressure is systolic 90, we still give it carefully and it still works. They can still handle it. The SGLT2s for me is a wonder drug. I mean, that's, that's doing so well. But um, the very sick word, I think, will be have the best position in the ones that you cannot stabilize. Um, the trial showed that very clearly. And um, I think that um, the battle against heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with these new medications is going to give a completely new light on how much we can do because the patient I showed to you was an older one, right? You saw that I had uh, the first infarction then and then later and later. But if we now treat our patients from the beginning with these very good drugs, probably we are able to preserve a lot of the LV function for much older age. I enjoyed very much. Thank you for your lecture. Thank you very much, Thank Professor you. John, for this very interesting lecture. And uh, so happy, I so appreciate it for you. I great thanks for your uh, sharing. With, I hope to see you again in the, our uh, society for very uh, interesting action, uh, lecture Look, again. I have, um, I have about I don't know, 20 or so, or 30 different lectures. To Arnie, if the patient is still symptomatic and uh, if he can't tolerate the drug, what means it can't tolerate? Especially his pressure, his pressure. He has a good pressure, then it's better to shift him to, because with Arnie, you are tackling uh, two missions. You have the RAS inhibition and the beneficial effect of uh, nitro uh, because these vasoactive peptides are very beneficial. So you will get يعني, two goals in one shoot with this medication. So we found that most, it is interestingly as Professor Pax say that the, the drug is well tolerated even in rather hypotensive patients. What we, know, what we notice in general, even without ARNI, when a pressure with a, with a rather borderline blood pressure, you can, Dr. Mohammed agree with me, once you start him with the, with the treatment with a, AC inhibitors or ARBs, you, can, uh, you, you see that his pressure improves. Okay? Yes, definitely. Because of we, improvement of his cardiac function. And this definitely. is uh, true, definitely. Dr. Tahseen Nam. أكيد يعني هو سامي يعني it's really interesting يعني the, the next visit his pressure is better and the next visit is even better 
So you have to titrate, as we mentioned, we have to titrate up. Even if the patient is doing well and he tells you that I am well, why you build up my dose? Because he should achieve the most benefit of the drug at maximal doses. السؤال الثاني يعني 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 اشوف انه هنا تو امبورتنت ايشو طبعا هو الرينال فانكشن از امبورتنت اند از وي سي ذات بلو كثيرهم كرياتينين بلو 3 او اليفيشن اذا اكو اليفيشن يعني مو اكثر من 30 ميل بير we can start with we can start AC inhibitors إذا, yes uh, and we have uh, the, the second issue is the pressure يعني, those with a borderline pressure we can start just with a very minimal dose even يعني, below the scheduled doses uh, I think it is better to start him whatever low dose is is better than uh, uh, avoiding the drug. And the next visit, you, you can reassess and probably build up the dose or stopping the, the, the medication according to the subsequent renal function and the uh, Thank you very uh, much. Uh, Dr. Nazar, Dr. Abbas, the, the main two factors uh, in assessing the dose, starting dose of this drug are the initial blood pressure and whether the patient initially on AC inhibitor or AC receptor blocker. Yes. If the patient is not on AC inhibitor or AC receptor blocker previously and his blood pressure borderline, we can start minimum dose. If and just, on, just to mm, add, uh, uh, mm. Hamid, just to add one point, and no, AC inhibitor is the first rank, then the IR. IRB is, is alternative. Yes, definitely. Yes. Uh, and the uh, army, uh, the, the priority for the army now. Yes. If the patient initially, for example, on maximum dose of AC inhibitor or ARB, and you start decision to shift him to uh, uh, Entresto, for example, you should give him the Entresto in doses comparable with the previous doses of ARB or AC inhibitor that has been received by the patient. Mm. And, and this is... Uh, no. Uh, at one point, you, go like, and, uh, you have to uh, keep him 36 hours free of AC inhibitor. Then yes, you start uh, for the uh, risk of angioedema. But this is يعني, theoretical more than practical. Practically, يعني, especially if we don't take high doses, you can do it. Definitely. Definitely. Um, if you can, 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 if it is important to mention that the combination recommended by the guideline is dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers with the beta blockers because it does not have an effect on the reduction of heart rate between the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Mr. Ali, the combination of calcium channel blocker and beta blocker are safe, yes. especially one, mm. when one of them, such as beta blocker, was mm -hmm. not enough to reduce the heart mm -hmm. rate to the desired heart rate needed exactly, exactly. for the patient so, with ischemic heart disease. Uh, and uh, uh, considering only the ejection fraction of the patient. Yeah. If the patient had normal ejection fraction, you can okay. give beta blocker and calcium channel blocker safely. If the one of them, such as beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, was unable to control the target that you want in blood pressure and mm -hmm. or heart rate. However, okay. the IV combination of these two drugs are contraindicated. Yes, yes, no. yes. No. But no. the oral the oral can be given safely considering no. the blood pressure and uh, pulse rate of the patient. No. Thank no. you, Dr. Mohammed. Okay. okay. Uh, احنا نشكر جميع الحضور وبالاخص المحاضرين بروفيسور جوريان باكس واستشاري امراض القلب الدكتور نزار حسن السوداني على جهدهم نشكر الشركه الراعيه على رعايتها لهذه لهذه الفعاليه 
نشكر جميع الحضور على تخصيصهم هذا الوقت الثمين حقيقة للاستماع ومشاهدة هذا الويبنار شكرا جزيلا للجميع شكرا جزيلا شكرا بس أنا ما أعرف ليش بس أنا ما أعرف ليش الشركة لاغية الفيديو مالتي ما أقدر أطلع لا لا عفوا دكتور بس بس توغط على الكاميرا لا لا مو أني أنتو لا لا مو أني أنتو لأن كل ما أفتح فيديو يقول لي من الهذا ها هاي وحدة ثانيا هاي ثاني مرة سووها بي ايش هم هذا الفيديو؟ هذا الفيديو اشتغل استاذ استاذ دكتور محمد ما اريد بعد ايش بعد ما خلصت خلصت المحاضره طبعا بالنهايه طبعا استاذنا دكتور محمد الهاشم اعتذر دكتور لا العفو العفو شكر والتقدير طبعا لجهود الكبيره في الفقه العلميه المميزه جريت ثانكس ابريشيشن تو بروفيسور جيرون باكس فور فيري انترستنج ليكشر اولسو Great thanks to my dear brother, Dr. Nazar Hassan Sudani, cardiologist for very, very interesting lecture in clinical practice. And I say a practical lecture. Hakika, shukran jazeel and Dr. Ali Mihsin for a very interesting lecture on hypertension. Of course. And the last one, Dr. Mohamed Hashim, the Mayahid, Stad Nuala, the first lecture. إن شاء الله رح نلتقي قريبا على فعاليات علمية مميزة الشكر والتقدير لشركة أسينو اللي تقيم دائما ساعدنا وترعانا هاي الفعاليات العلمية المميزة دائما هم يعني سباقين بجهودهم الكبيرة في رعاية وتقديم ومساندة جمعية أطباء الباطنية الذيقة الشكر الخاص للأخ العزيز الدكتور ليد جبار جهوده كبيرة طبعا الدكتور حسام أيضا <تصفيق> شكر والتقدير للجميع للحضور لاساتذتي طبعا اللي شرفوني بالحضور من كل العراق استاذ حسن الفرحان استاذ عمار كل الاساتذه اللي موجودين مع حفظ الاسماء والالقاب وايضا الشكر والتقدير لكل الاخوه والاخوات الاعزاء اللي حضروا من كل محافظات العراق انا اتقدم بشكر جزيل للجميع وان شاء الله راح نلتقي على فعاليه علميه مميزه اخرى ورمضان كريم وكل عام وانتم بخير تقبل الله طاعاتكم شكرا جزيلا نشكركم على خير اجمعين على خير اجمعين على خير مع السلامه